Welcome. Welcome to week two, CS110. I hope everybody had a nice weekend. Uh, I apologize for the lab sign-up fiasco. It was only half an hour, but there were some people who were definitely concerned about getting signed up. Um, it looks like most people have signed up. I can tell already that the Thursday times were pretty important. Um, they, uh, it looks like most people wanted to do the Thursday times. Um, but, uh, and in fact, there's still some spots in the earlier time. Uh, but there's plenty of Friday times, and you guys are signed up for the class during this uh, term, so it should be all right, hopefully. If for some reason you are not able to uh, get your um, lab time in or whatever, let me know. We'll try to figure something else out. Um, but, uh, but for the most part, uh, it looks like a lot of people got what they wanted, and some people might be didn't, so just let me know if there's a big issue. That's not going to work. Okay. Um, so we are on to just replugging my tablet in here because it seems to be giving me fits. Hang on a sec. Let's see if this works. Maybe not. Maybe we don't do the tablet today. Hold on one second. Try one other thing. Try this. It doesn't work, it doesn't work. Oh, there we go. All right, we'll see if that works. Okay. There we go. All right, so um, today we are going to continue with file systems. Uh, we're going to talk specifically about some data structures that the operating system has set up for, the, for keeping track of files and for keeping track of your processes as well, as it turns out. Uh, and then, and remember, this is the way Unix does it, or this is the way Linux does it. It's not the way everything does it, but it happens to be the way Linux does it. And uh, it happens to be a pretty good system for keeping track of your files for, uh, for what it's worth. So we're going to do that. Then we're going to talk about system calls. We have seen some system calls already, um, and we've used some. But we're going to talk about the details of, wait, what does it mean to have a system call versus a regular function? All right, and then finally, uh, we should have time to start getting into uh, the first kind of, whoa, this is a different way of programming, which is multiprocessing. Okay, so I hope, uh, hope you enjoy that part because it's actually kind of neat once you start going, whoa, that's really, I didn't really know you could do that for the program. So that's what I think makes, uh, makes this stuff fun. All right, the assignment going all right? Assignment one going okay? It's due Wednesday. No, uh, there are no extensions available allowed on uh, no like late days for the first assignment. And then the second assignment will be out on Wednesday as well. All right, come to office hours if you're still having trouble. Okay, so Linux, when you run a program, your program ends up in what's called a process, or it has a process that is basically saying it's given a number and it says this program is running. And that's the process that it's running under, OK? We'll get to the details about how that can change a little, a little later. Uh, but Linux maintains data structures to keep track of these processes. Of course it does, right? The operating system needs to know about your, uh, your programs that are running. And so there's some data structure that it keeps track of. Uh, so it keeps track of all the different parts of all the different things that are associated with your program. Okay, um, they're called process control blocks. Okay, they're called process control blocks, and they have lots of information in them. Okay, and they are stored in this thing called the process table, which is organized by the operating system. Okay, process control blocks uh, store lots of things. One thing that they score, store is called the descriptor table, and the descriptor table is a data structure that holds information about the files you've opened or the files that have been opened for you or the file-like things that have been opened for you or that you've opened. Like for instance, networking is modeled using a file. The terminal is actually modeled using the file. You can print to the terminal just like, or you can read and write from the terminal just like you read and write from a file. That's one of the beauties, beautiful things about Unix is they treat everything like a file if you can as it turns out. But anyway, they keep this thing called the descriptor uh, table. And each process maintains its own set of descriptors, okay, which is the things that it has open at the time. And we all, they always get 0, 1, and 2 for free. Those are standard out, standard in, or standard in, standard out, and standard error. They kind of get those for free, 
Okay? Most often they are what we call bound to the terminal. In other words, you type something and it goes to standard in. You print out something from your program, it goes to either standard out or to standard error. And those are the normal things. Now we will spend lots of time in this course talking about, hey, what happens if we remap standard in to something else, to reading in from a file, or standard in, stand, or, or the output of another program. We'll talk lots about that as, uh, as the course goes, uh, goes along. Okay, uh, the descriptors, as we've seen, you use read, write, close, etc., open um, to actually interact with the files descriptors, and then the process control block keeps track of all the different, all the uh, d details of that. Okay, if you do an open on a, a file, you generally get a very small integer as the file descriptor because zero, one, and two are taken, and then it just kind of goes up from there. And it's uh, your own file descriptors are fairly small numbers generally. Okay, all right. Now this this diagram kind of goes down many levels here, not many, a few levels, and we kind of have to understand each little uh, level as we go. Uh, if the file descriptor, uh, if a descriptor is in use, in other words, it's an open file. Okay, uh, it maintains a link to this thing called the open file table entry. Okay, so if you have a file that's open, you've got this thing called an open file table entry, which has some details about the file. Okay, it has things like um, uh, it, it, takes, it takes into account whether or not it's a read-only file or a read-write file or a write-only file or so forth. It takes, it has, and that's the mode part of it. It also has this thing called the cursor, which just like the cursor on your screen, tells you like where in the file you're reading from. Okay. So it turns out that you can do that. Uh, it also turns out that multiple programs can open the same file and be reading from different parts of it at the same time. Okay, so lots of, lots of uh, files could be opened by various different programs. And in fact, they end up having this cursor saying, hey, this program is at this point in the file and this program is at this point. That's the cursor. Okay, it's also got this thing called the ref count. Now the ref count uh, discusses how, or, or basically keeps track of how many descriptors across all processes actually refer to that session. Okay, and that's important because if you close the file, it maybe some other file needs to leave it open or something, so it's not going to close it. And it just has this reference count of that. We will talk about what this other one, this V node, is uh, in a second. But if you were to do something like, say, uh, open some file name as read only, well, this is what you uh, might end up with. You might end up with mode being read, because you've opened it as read only, cursor being at zero, because it was just opened and the cursor's right at the beginning. Ref count is one. Maybe you're the only one on the system that has that file open. It's pretty likely. And the V node we'll get to in a second. Okay, so that's how that, uh, that's how that works. All right, and in fact, this is for process 1001, which you can't see because that's way too small, but process ID 1001. Later today, we'll talk about what process IDs actually are all about. Okay, all right. So, what else do we have? Well, multiple, all the different processes on your computer are take, each have their own process control blocks and their own descriptor tables, but they all point to a common open file table. It's actually a little hard to read too, I think, but that's the open file table. And this is where you have all of the details of, that, that we talked about on the previous page, but it may be more than one file might, or more than one uh, process may point to it, okay? Now, it turns out if you have a cursor, like if two files are pointing to, if two files are at different places in the, uh, in the actual file, then you need to have two different things you're pointing at, okay? But that's the basic deal. There's one open file table for uh, all of the file resources, and this is so you can share them. I mean, if 25 different programs are opening a file, you want to be able to share them. Question? So the yellow and green and the blue are the process control blocks. The, those, yes, the yellow and the green and the blue are the process control blocks for a process. So your program's running, it might be the yellow one. My program's running, it might be the green one. And remember, we can all log on to Myth at the same time, so we could be running different programs at the same time. We each get our own process control blocks for the, oper the operating system does it. Now, this is hidden from you, by the way. It's not like you can go and dig into your process control block. The operating system keeps track of that. Good question. Any other questions at this point? Yeah. How do you keep track of uh, which file has which 
So, good question. How do you keep track of which file has which, which cursor? Um, these will actually point to different ones that if they're at different places in the file. So then you've got, I think you've got another one that's open that has a different cursor associated with it. Um, that's because you might be reading at different places. So you're going to have two copies of that in that case. Okay. And we'll talk about what the V node does in a second too, because that's another one. All right. So we want to be able to keep, tr keep track of all these files uh, that are shared. Okay. Um, in the case of 0, 1, and 2 up here, okay, this, this has a 0 and a 0 and a 0. That's standard in, and they all happen to point down to this first one right here. If we look down here, and then this one's all the way over here. And they all point to that one. Why? Because they're all reading from the same standard in, depending on which program happens to have control of the terminal at that point or the, whatever the, the keyboard's going. Okay, you can't type in a keyboard and have it go to two different programs, as it turns out. Okay, it's only going to go to one program, basically. I mean, there's a little new, more nuance than that, but it's, that's basically the idea. Um, you also, they also, by the way, all their standard outs go down to this one. Okay, and this one actually is interesting. If you, uh, if you happen to be running one uh, program, and, and this is a standard app for like your programs that you own, if they all, for like one kind of session, if they all are, are uh, printing things out, they all go to the terminal. So you can run, for instance, make, which you do for your assignments, right? And make calls G++. Well, make may have some output messages. They go to the terminal. And so does G++, because they share the same file descriptor in that case. Okay, the same, they share the same entry in the open file table, in other words. And that's just so that you can, can all, they can all go to the terminal, as it turns out. Okay, so that's the basics of that. Well, guess what? We can talk about these things called a V node. So the V node is just a structure that holds the information about the file kind of like a cache. And when we say cache, we mean a place in memory that is storing something instead of going back to the original location, right? It's stored in, in RAM memory and it's very fast. And that's what's happening with the V node here. Okay, the V node is basically saying, um, it's basically storing the details about what kind of file it is. Is it a regular file? Is it a directory, et cetera? It also stores the reference count, how many things have this file open. And then it st uh, stores a bunch of other details needed to actually access the file, so a bunch of pointers. And then it stores a copy of the inode, which we talked about uh, last week, which is the information about a particular file. So if a file is open, you don't need to go back and if you want to read from it, you don't have to go back and, and go and try to find it again in the file system. You've got the information about the inode right there. Okay, so that's the details. And this gets updated as the file gets written to and, and so forth. Um, but, uh, and then that gets, uh, that gets pulled in. So those are the levels of the uh, data structures that the operating system and your program keep track of in order to, uh, in order to keep track of what files we have open. Yes? Why does it store the ref count in two places? Uh, that's probably a good question. It may be depending on who's reading it when, or which part of the per which part of the operating system is reading it when. It'll go to either the uh, it'll go to either the V node or the open file table entry. I'm not sure why it does both, but it, they should be. I think they should be locked up. Yeah. If you have different if you have, you mean like this one might, this one might also point, that would be a bad example of one, but that one might also point there. Yeah, so the ref count down here is how many of the open file table entries point to that V node. Like you could have the same file open in two different ways, okay, because of you've opened them and, and, and that's, I think that's the, the answer there. Yeah. Question. It is a copy from the disk. Yeah, this, let me show you the next one right here. Uh, not the next one. Um, I'll, get it, I'll get to it. What it basically does is it just reads it from the disk and then stores it in memory so you don't have to go look it up again on the disk. Um, just faster that way. The faster you can do that, the better if you're, you're dealing with things like memory. Okay. Yeah, how's that? That's a good question. The question is, is the open file table sorted in any way? No, 
It's not sorted in any particular way. Um, you basically keep links to it. It's not like you're searching through the whole thing to find things generally. You have a, like if your process opens a file, it, this green process might open this file. Well, it's got a link right there and it knows how to search that very quickly. And then it'll find here and then this might point to a V node and that'll be, so it's, it's not a slow process. It's not, and these things aren't giant either. There might be thousands of files open, but honestly thousands is small on computer speak. So it's not a huge, huge amount. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so let's say I'm, I'm a process that's moving a file and I'm moving my cursor. So does that, like, are these blocked in the open file table being created and destroyed as I move my cursor? Or is it just that you create? Right. So this is a good question. I actually have to remember the answer. The question was hey, if I'm started, if I read from some file with this one and another file is also pointing to it at the same time, which cursor is getting updated? I believe it may actually create a whole new entry in that case if it needs to have different cursors in different places. Like if, if one, if, if, it's, if it's reading through, it needs to know where it's reading from. And so I think there's another one that created it. I'll look that up. I'm not 100% sure on where that one differentiates. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Let's move on to another one here. Okay. Um, there, well, I've already kind of uh, talked about this. There's one system-wide V node table basically because everybody has to share these things because you don't want to have them all independent if you can help them, help that. Okay, it's kind of like an alias. It says, hey look, somebody's opened this file. Why keep multiple copies of it for each person that's, or each file that's opened it? Let's just keep it all in one place. And then there's some coordination that has to go to deal with the cursors and so forth. No problem. All right. And like I said, the, uh, well, first of all, none of this is really available to you just as the user. The kernel keeps track of this. You don't really want that, by the way. I mean, you don't want you as the user to be able to walk through the uh, open file table and see other people's files and what other programs have files open or be able to change any details about that. So you want that to be um, somewhat secure. And then um, this little inode, is, and this is basically separate from the file system, by the way. Um, the file system is kind of on the disk, and you keep a copy in memory of, for instance, this little yellow inode slice in memory. Okay? And I'm not 100% I'm not sure when that actually gets updated, so, um, but it, uh, like if it gets modified, that probably propagates through at some point, but it may not be immediate, depending on the file system uh, you're using. Okay, so those are the big things. Now, if you read the, not the big textbook, but the smaller textbook, the one that's online, this is all laid out in that pretty explicitly as well. So if you need more details about it, go with that. All right, that's file systems, like more details about that. Let's move on to system calls. This is where some interesting things happen. Uh, system calls are, as I've said, I've said this a number of times, System calls are the way your program interacts with your hardware and the network and things that are probably not so great to have your program directly access it. Why? Because you guys are mean and would write malicious programs, right? Like that's the basic idea. This didn't always start this way. Unix, when it first started out, you, it was a very open sort of system and everybody, it was in a research environment and nobody was going to go muck around in somebody else's files. But when, the, when it started getting more and more and more users, they realized, hey, we better figure out how to make this so that there's good security. And a system call is the way that works. Okay? So we've seen some system calls already. We've seen open and read and write and close and stat, lstat. Those are all system calls. Okay? We'll see lots and lots of more system calls because remember, this class is all about interacting with the operating system. And, um, the functions are different, okay? We write functions, or you wrote some functions for 107 or 107E that would have gone into, let's say, libc, or just your user functions, or lib standard C++. Um, system calls have to be privileged, okay? They have to access their own data structures that your program shouldn't have access to, um, and they should be able to uh, be partitioned off from the rest of the user. Okay, and so that's what uh, what you really want to be able to able to do. Okay, open needs access to the open file descriptor table, and well, or the op and and you don't want to be able to make the user have access to that. Okay, in other words, we shouldn't be able to get access to privileged information, yet we still need to be able to open and close files. 
Okay, so that's the bottom line there. So we need to have a different call and return model. Now, if you took CS107 or CS107E, uh, you'll remember that each process, or maybe you don't, but maybe this was never explicit, made explicit to you. Um, in 107E, those of you who took that, it was pretty straightforward that the one program that was running has access to all of the memory in the system. For 107 or for 106B or whatever, you run a program, it thinks it has access to the entire system memory. Okay, your program, as far as it's concerned, can write and read from any part in memory. Now, you can get seg faults and things because you're not actually given that from the operating system. You can't just willy-nilly do it, but that's the operating system saying, look, here's your portion. But in the bigger picture, it's not like if you were able to access a different portion of memory, some other program would be also accessing it. Your program thinks it has all of memory. This is going to become very important uh, in a few minutes. But the 64-bit address space, first of all, it's gigantic. Okay, Two of the 64 is a very, very, very big number. Um, and, as, and the way the operating system and the hardware works, it, like I said, makes it seem like your program has access to the entire memory system, but it really doesn't. This is a virtualization layer. What happens is you've got virtual memory which is the addresses that your program thinks it's writing to, and then that gets translated into what we call physical memory, which is the operating system and the hardware saying, okay, this program actually has the memory here, and this program has the memory up here, even though they both think they're writing to the same place. Okay, so, uh, so it turns out that you can, you can do that. I wanted to show you an example of that. Um, so I wrote a program and I was gonna run it in two places at the same time and show that it was the same memory uh, place. But it turns out that, they, that the operating system plays some games with that so it doesn't ever put the same one even nearby. It, it probably would if you, if, you, if you tried to get a huge amount of memory. But, um, but for, you know, for the purposes of this, I couldn't quite demonstrate it because the, it was also a security measure too, by the way. I don't know if you remember from CS107, if you took that, when you run a program, um, the stack ends up in a slightly different place and there's these canaries in there that say whether or not the stack gets overwritten by a malicious user or something. Those are all security issues. I think it's the same, same sort of thing. But anyway, no process uses all two, two to the 64 bytes, okay? Um, most programs use a very, very small amount, okay? All right, so that's kind of the setup here. There are lots of different segments in the memory system. You talked about some of these in 106 or, one, or 107 or 107E. You've got the stack. The stack is where your user program keeps all of its local variables, it keeps its arrays, and it keeps its kind of local data for functions. The stack also is where function calls get pushed onto, all the data for function calls get pushed onto, and you've got the function calls, the function calls in order on the stack. Okay, you've also got the heap. You guys wrote a heap allocator, and heap allocators uh, get memory in bigger chunks generally, and that's a different portion of memory. There's also uh, the code section, or also called the text section. That's where your code is held. Okay, there's a data section which is um, which has part of the data for like global variables, things like that, okay? And the, this, this whole thing is managed basically by the operating system for your process, okay? The operating system says, here's some memory for your process, here's your stack, here's your heap, uh, here's the data, here's the code, go. And it, it's, it could look very similar program to program, but again, it's kind of abstracted a little bit away, okay? All right, there's other segments that you may not have talked about, okay? There's the shared, 107E definitely talks about this. There's the shared library portion and the uh, BSS portion and the read-only data segment. Those are all segments that have their specialized uses. Read-only data, as you can imagine, is read-only data. You're only allowed to read to it. You're not allowed to write to it. Um, they've got uh, the shared libraries. If you have a function like printf, Right? If you have printf, well, there might be many, many, many programs all using printf at the same time to print out to their individual terminals. Well, why duplicate that code for every user? Just put it in one code location and have that user, or have the user jump to that code location and run the shared code. That's a good way to save some memory. Okay, and that's the way shared, shared uh, libraries work. Okay? All right, so how do programs call, do function calls? You should maybe remember this from 107. You have a stack pointer. 
right? And you have all these other uh, registers in here as well, okay? To call a function, what do you do? Well, you put a bunch of data inside the registers. RDI, RSI, RDX, hopefully this is, some of this is coming back to you from 107, right? RCX, et cetera. If you run out of registers, in other words, the one, two, three, four, five, six, you start putting them on the stack and there's a very well-defined way of doing that, okay? And again, this is some people decided, hey, this is the way it's gonna be, so this is the way we're gonna do it. It's not like this is some, come down from high sort of, you have to do it. It's somebody decided this and said, that's what we're gonna do. The first, uh, the first uh, parameter is always gonna go into RDI. The second parameter is always gonna go into RSI, et cetera. Okay? And then you do this call queue or call uh, assembly instruction, and that jumps to the program code for your, uh, for your other function in your own user space, and then it does the call, and then you do a return and it comes back. That should be relatively familiar, okay, from doing 107 or 107E, although in 107E you didn't have these register names. They were nice like R0, R1, R2. Here there they were all these, uh, these historical names from x86 days, uh, the original x86 days, okay? So that's how function calls work. Well, uh, what's the, the big deal with that? Well, this does not encapsulate the memory that we use. In other words, it doesn't hide that memory from anything else, okay? If you have uh, your, let's say you have your main stack frame here, okay, and then you call a function, just a regular function called load files, well that's going to go on the stack, okay? And then you uh, do your if stream or whatever, that might go on the stack and then that's going to call other like read and write function uh, system calls. But in this case, remember from 107 where you did all that like sneaky stuff with, I don't know if you still do this with like ATM machines and trying to hack in and whatever because you can go and you can, you can go and, and modify your own stack and, and whatever. You can do that, but that's not very secure, okay? In other words, it's privacy is not the prime concern here. Basically, they're saying, look, if you own the stack, for your program, sure, you wanna muck around in your own stack, go right ahead, who cares? You might crash your program or you might modify something for your own program, but that doesn't matter, right? That doesn't matter. It, all the things change, everything changes when you all of a sudden have to go to, uh, when you have to go to the system and get information from the system, okay? So, now we get to system calls. Well, system calls, okay, like open, uh, they, as we said, I said a 100 times already, they shouldn't be exposed, and they are, need to be stored in a region of memory that your program does not have access to. Okay? It can't be a shared library. It can't be something that your program could actually code that you write, modify. It just shouldn't be allowed. Okay? So what do we do? Well, we break up the memory diagram into a space that has the kernel stack in it. Okay? You are not allowed to write to there. And if you tried to, the operating system would stop you anyway. Okay, but the kernel stack resides in memory, but your programs do not have access to that. Okay, you basically have to tell the operating system, hey, I am about to do something, or I want you to do something for me that involves something I shouldn't have a direct access to. Okay, so it needs to be in a region of memory that the user can't touch, and it needs to be executed in a privileged, what we call super user mode. Okay, so that that mode can have access to that. This is not your code anymore. Okay, it's the code that's owned by the kernel. Okay, the kernel owns the, that code, and you have to say to the kernel, hey, go do this for me. Okay, it's called kernel space, and um, it's got the stack segment, and it's got its own uh, instructions as well. Okay, we can't use call queue anymore to do this. Okay, uh, because the minute we use call queue, that stays within our own address space. We could, we could uh, do that, so we need a different way of doing it. What is that different way? Well, uh, that different way is to do a thing called a syscall. And it's an actual instruction. I'm going to show it to you uh, in a second. Okay? And what it is, is you place an opcode. In other words, an operation you want to do. All the operations that are the system codes have, an, have a number associated with them. If you want to read, you've got one for the operation code. If you want to write, it's two. Open happens to be three. We'll see that one in a minute. Open is three, etc. Okay, they all have their own opcodes that are based in the kernel defines them. Okay, and then you place arguments, same as before, 
you place them in a bunch of registers. Now it happens for some reason, it goes RSI, RDI, RSI, RDX, R10 instead of RCX. I don't know why that's changed, but some other reason for that. Um, not, not important for this class at all, um, but that's, uh, that's the way that goes. And then what you, do, what you do is you perform what's called an interrupt. 107E folks, you'll know what interrupts are, but an interrupt is basically saying, hey operating system, stop my program and handle this. And the operating system goes, oh okay, your program's not gonna be stopped, and then I'm gonna go do, I'm gonna look at the registers and do whatever you want, and then I'm gonna start your program up again. That's basically what an interrupt is doing. It's interrupting your program until whatever you're asking get, to get done gets done. Okay? We're going to see that a lot in this course of your program waiting around for something else to get done, being in some sort of interrupted state or sleep state or something like that. Okay? So you put all these things in the, uh, in the registers, you do this syscall, it handles it, and then it returns back to you with the result, as you might expect, in RAX, except for a couple things. There's a question. Oh, yeah. What happens if you have more than six arguments? Oh, such a good question. The question was... Yeah, this question was, what happens if you have more than six arguments? You don't. There are no system calls that, are, that have more than six arguments in them. That's by the rules, be because of that exact reason. You, you don't have access to put them on the stack, so they, uh, they get put in the, uh, just in the registers you have, and no system calls need more. There are, there are ways of getting around that, by the way, you can, but, but in, in general, there are no system calls that have more than six. Other questions? Yeah. Ah. Yeah, let me talk about the interrupt handler. Good question. The question was just like, what's, what's this deal with the interrupt handler? It's another function that's actually uh, in the kernel space that runs. And that function goes, okay, now I'm in kernel space. I'm the, I'm the kernel. I get to do and I get to access all things. You can't affect that function at all, uh, but you can call it. And, and that, in calling it through this syscall uh, method that we have here. That's how you do it. So what's the bottom line on that? This is how you tell the operating system, please do something for me because I'm not allowed. You're not allowing me to do this. System calls are way, the way you do that. And then there's some, some details about what happens if um, you return to the regular function and there was an error. If you, uh, if you have a return fun uh, value that is uh, negative, what it does is it sets the error number, or error no, which is that uh, global variable, to the positive value of that negative value. Why? That's just the way they've, they've done it. Um, and then you update RAX to actually contain negative 1. So if you do a system call and you get back negative 1, you know that you've, uh, that you've got an issue. And, um, and then you go and check the error number. OK? Yeah. Um, error no is per process. So error, number, error no is per process, yes. It's part of the C library, yes. So then yeah. the kernel has to know that every process has. Yes. So when you call the when you when you do the interrupt, the the kernel knows that your process is the one that interrupted. It knows where to find it. Yeah, and it knows where to find those details. Yeah. Good question. Anybody else? All right. So that's how system calls work. I'm not going to ask you too many more de too many details about this. I'm not going to certainly not going to like make you do any assembly coding or anything like that um, for this. But I do want to just show you what happens when, uh, when you do this. Remember the copy function that we had? The copy function opened up two files, opened up a file to read from, opened up a file to write, write to, and then copied all the data out of one into the other. Let's look at that in GDB. And let's actually, let's see, let's stop it on uh, line 19. We'll break on line 19 and we'll run the program. Okay, well, whoops, I gotta run it with, let's say, copy.c to copy, copy.c. Okay, all right, so now we've stopped on line 19 and we're about to step into the system call. If I do s to actually step into the system call, you'll see that it goes into syscall template. We haven't quite called the actual system call yet because we have to do the setup. In other words, we have to set the, um, we have to set the parameters and we have to actually do that syscall, but, uh, we can do disassemble here, and we'll notice that you have things like the a couple things going on here that this is not really that important, but it's going to move some of some detail, like move 02. Remember I said open was 02 for the operation code? Well, there it goes right there. 
Okay, and and I think I said R D I is the uh, where the actual uh, name of the pro or the first argument. Remember, open. Here's what open looks like. It is. Let's see. Hang on. Uh, let's just list 19 again. Oops. Mm, oh, list. There it is. So that's what the open call is argv1, which I typed was copy.c. Okay, is there. All right, so let's actually do this. Uh, let's do this. For i dollars on RIP. This will actually list all the different um, instructions as I'm going through it. Let's step into the instructions one at a time. Okay, it's going to do a couple things that aren't that important, but then it's going to move 02, which is the opcode, into EAX or RAX, and then it's going to do the syscall. Okay, and it's going to do the syscall. So if we look, uh, RAX is going to be 2. Well, that's the opcode for open. If we print out RDI, let's cast it to a char star, RDI, it should be, there we go, copy.c. Okay, so it's done the setup and it's about to uh, call the function for us. Okay, and do the system call. Now, you might ask yourself, oh great, can I step into the system call? kind of impossible to step into a system call because the operating system is running your program which is running GDB or I guess is running GDB which is running your program and stepping into the operating system would mean trying to like stop the operating system and it just wouldn't work <laughs> as it turns out it would be impossible to do that if you want to debug a kernel you actually generally have to do it from another computer that's talking to the other computer uh, basically through like a connection of some sort it's, it's tricky to debug a kernel because it's got to be running and you can't really uh, debug it that easily or put it in some other virtual machine or something like that. So anyway, um, if we, uh, let's just actually do SI and see what happens. It actually jumps, it actually, let's see, I believe it jumped back, oh it's, yeah, jumped back to our thing. If we finish, let's do p rax. yeah, we had a positive return value which is going to mean there was a, it was success in that case. Okay, so that's how um, that's how system calls work. It's kind of like calling a function. It's just you don't say call, you say syscall, which stops your process and turns over to the kernel. Okay? What questions do you have about that, system calls? Okay. Relatively straightforward. I mean, that shouldn't look too uh, new to you. Just know that most of the functions we're going to use are system calls because of the type of class that this is. Okay, here's the summary. Summary is, we use system calls because we don't want the user to have access to sensitive parts. Great. Uh, we can't do that using our regular function call. Why? Because we own that memory. We're allowed to, to uh, touch all that memory. And so if our, for our uh, code is accessing things that it shouldn't be, that would be bad because we could be malicious. Okay? Um, and then the way this happens is through an interrupt called syscall and that stops your program, translate, transfers over to the operating system and does that. And then uh, once the kernel's running, it's in control, does the opening, closing, reading from a disk, whatever, and then afterwards it returns back to your program. Okay? All right. What questions do you have about those right now? System calls. Anything else? Okay, again, this is, this is, in the, this is talked about in the, in the book. Um, and in fact, I think it's talked about in the Bryant and O'Hallorhan book as well. Okay, let us move on to a fun topic called multiprocessing. Okay, so far we have been talking about programs that ever since 106A, 106B, 107 generally, your programs are running a single process. Okay. A process that is going along and it might be doing lots of things, but it's one process at a time. Okay? It used to be that one process was all computers could actually run. Anybody know what computer that one is on the board? It says it on there, you can kind of maybe see. It's an IBM personal computer from uh, about 1981. This was actually the computer I took to college. <laughs> um, it, did, it did not have a hard drive in it, like I said. Um, and uh, like I said the other day, um, it had a maximum of 640 kilobytes of memory, which was not that much. It ran at 4.77 megahertz. Your computers these days run at gigahertz. So it was relatively slow, but it actually had one process available at a time. You could run one thing on it at a time, and that was all you got. Now, it, uh, along the way, somebody, some clever people did write a program 
or some various programs that allowed you to kind of do multi-processing, but it was very rudimentary and it crashed a lot and it was didn't it didn't work particularly well. And your comp the computer was slow enough that doing multiple things at once didn't really make sense anyway. Okay. Well, these days we have really fast computers. Okay, we have computers that are gigahertz and that are running really at, at very high frequencies. Okay, and so we want to be able to run multiple programs at a time at the same time. Okay, this is called multiprocessing. All right, and uh, you will tell your computer to do things concurrently. In other words, you're going to write a program and it's going to be doing two different things potentially exactly the same time. And that's kind of interesting. Okay, I think that's, uh, that's very interesting. Um, what we can do to show you uh, a little bit about the process on your computer, in fact, I will pull this up here. Uh, let's see, processing. Okay, we are gonna open up, I think we are gonna open up get pidx.c. So when your program is running, as I said before, and we've kind of talked about this a couple times, it has a process ID associated with it. It is a process, and it has a process identif identifier associated with it. Okay, And we can actually get the identifier, if you want, by doing the following. PIDT, PID equals get PID. Okay. PID underscore T is just an integer. Okay, you're all, why don't we just call it integers? Well, they wanted to make it its own type. It's just type deft to an integer. Okay, you can do that. And then you can say print f uh, my process id percent d. It's just an integer pid and return zero. And that should do it. Whoops, except for I need a semicolon after that. There we go. Okay, make get. Oops, make get PIDX. Okay, get PIDX. Process ID was 15,787. Great. Process ID 15788. Process ID 15789. Now, if I wait a little bit, right, if we wait a little bit, it's probably not going to be 90, but it is in that case. Okay, so sometimes it is. <laughs> there are lots of uh, other processes being started and stopped on like Myth 55 right now that uh, we'll, pro we'll start going up in, uh, in order. Let's see if it goes up. Yep, there we go. We got a few more that kind of started up in there, whoosh, right? Um, but but, uh, but that's, what, that's what happens. So you're just given a number when your program's running, and that's your process ID, OK? All right. Uh, the process ID allows the operating system to keep track of you so that it, knows it can use your process control blocks, and, and it can do all that. Um, it can use your process ID number to say, you get to run for a chunk of time, and then some other program gets to run for a chunk of time. And this is why I can move my, this is why I can have the program, my program running, and I can also do things like write on the board while the program is, the other program is running in the background. The operating system is fast enough that it allows your computer to seem like multiple programs are running at once. Most of the time, there, there's only one thing running at a time, except for the fact that your computers these days all have multiple processors in them. And in fact, the myth machines all have four or eight different cores in them, which are individual processors, which means they actually do run more than one program at a time. Okay? You can actually see this if you go to, uh, I actually don't think they have this, I think I installed this, um, but we can, we can do it. But if you type H top, Okay, what HTOP does is it gives you a list of all the different programs that are running on the system from all the other users, too. And you think, wait a minute, I can know what other users are running? You can. <laughs> As it turns out, that's not hidden from, from you. And it also, in fact, this Myth Machine has eight different processors here, and you can see them all uh, running. Nobody's really doing anything right now. Like, this Myth happens to be very not busy. Right? Later in the quarter, we'll be in class and we'll look at this and it'll be like going crazy because some 107 assignment's going, you know, they're doing some crazy things or whatever. Okay? But that's what's going on here. You can actually look at this and it tells you what percentage of each processor is being used. Most of the time, it's pretty idle. But right now, not much is really going on. Okay? So that's, a, that's a, what processes are.
Okay, and um, like I said, your computers these days have multiple processors, which means they can run multiple programs at the same time, literally. It's not just time shifting or time splitting between the, the each process. It's literally two are running at the same time. Okay, and we'll see how this becomes important very soon. Okay, so we have a new system call. Okay, the new system call is called Fork, and it's... Uh, Obviously, it's I mean kind of like a fork that you eat from, but it really is like a fork in the road. <laughs> okay, this when we say fork, what fork does is it says the fork is a system call that allows you to create a new process from your program, so that now your program is going to literally go down two different code paths at the exact same time. Okay, that's what fork does. Did you have a question? No. Okay. So this is what fork actually does. Okay, we're going to see why that we might want to do that. You might be able to start thinking about why you might want to do that. But it's but for um, for the types of programs we're running in this class, multiple processes become very important. Here's what fork does, and this is a little subtle, and people always tend to forget this. So I'm going to explicitly say what it does. Fork creates one more new process. Okay, you've already got a process. Fork creates one more process. So a lot of people, for some reason, last quarter thought that it created two. It does not. Fork creates one, and now there are two. If each one of those forked, right, now there would be four, right? Because each one of those creates one more, and then there's a total of four, et cetera. All right, but your process, uh, if you fork, it creates one more process, and that is called the child process, because the parent is the one creating it, okay? And the fork call, uh, by the way, the child and parent, and this is the most interesting part about it, they both start executing on the next line after fork. It's not like you do fork and the one the, the child goes off somewhere else and does this and the, pro, pro, the parent goes off. No, no, they both go to the next instruction and now you've got two programs, two processes, running the next line in your code. Hmm. Which is kind of interesting. You'll see how it works in a, in a minute. Okay, Fork returns a PID t or an integer but it's only kind of a pid okay here's how it goes the parent when there when you call fork the parent's return value is the pid of the newly created child okay so you create a child it's a new process it gets a process id the parent gets that written in return okay so the parent actually can keep track of all its children that it creates and you can fork multiple times by the way so you can fork and you get back the, the ID of your child that you just forked. The child gets back zero, right? The child gets back zero. If the child got back its own PID, it wouldn't make much sense because then it wouldn't, like, you wouldn't be able to differentiate between the child and the parent. If the parent got back the child's PID and the child got back the parent's PID, how do we know who's who? we still can't make that decision, right? So the way it works, the parent gets back the child PID and the child gets back zero, which means you're the child PID, okay? You are the child. Now look, if the child wants to get its own PID, great, it can, it can call get PID, but the return from fork is zero if it's the child process. Does that make sense? This confused people for like for a while in uh, other other times I've taught this, and I'm not not exactly sure why. So I'm being very explicit about it. Yeah, Mark. Oh, good question. Um, if you're in the child process, you can do get PPID to get your parents' process if you want. Yeah, and this is a good this is good if you want to be let's say sending signals back and forth between the parent and the child. We'll talk about that later in the course. Okay, but yes, you can if you want to. You don't get it for, by default. In fact, it's most often that the child could care less what its parent's PID is, as it turns out. But you can get it if you want to. Okay? Now, here's the other interesting part about this. All the memory between the parent and the child is identical. I can't draw the, the straight line at the bottom of this tablet. <laughs> um, all the memory is identical, but it is not shared. Okay, so I create an integer, int a, and then I fork, right? On the next line, the parent has an integer, int a, the child has an integer, int a, 
The parent, let's say the pointer to the parent's version of A is 0x1234. The child's version is 0x1234, the pointer to that. If the child changes A, the parent's does not change. How does that work? Any ideas? Yeah. Exactly. The answer was, it doesn't. It's not really the same exact memory. They are now they are now separate memory, but they think they're the same part in memory. Now, what it does is, you'd think, wait a minute. If I have a huge amount of code and I fork, isn't this going to be really slow? Because this kind of somehow has to copy all the data from like the parent to the child. It does this thing called copy on write. In other words, the operating system is clever enough not to make any copies until either the parent or the child changes a value. So it's kind of shared in the sense that the operating system is keeping track of it all. But the instant you change a value in one, in the child or the parent, it is not reflected in the opposite, the child, the, your parent if you're the child. Not reflected. You make it. The operating system makes a copy of it. Says, "Okay, great. Now you have your value, and you have your value." Okay. It's a very interesting, interesting uh, concept, as it turns out. It, they did this for lots of reasons. They did it uh, so that they can make it so that the programs can go to the next line and not worry about any of the the data. And they also did it in the way they did so that it's fast. So that's kind of neat. Okay. What questions do you have on that? How fork works? Yeah. Ah, good question. So we're going to see, actually, we're not quite going to see exactly that. But um, it, the question was, what happens when the parent process is terminated? Uh, the child process keeps going. Yeah, process, child process just keeps going. Now, it turns out that you might end up going back to the terminal because your parent is what's running in the terminal. And the child process might end at some time later after you've typed some other command or whatever. So it's a little bit, but of course, we have a way of dealing with that, which we'll talk about, like how to make sure that your parent doesn't end before your child does and so forth. Um, but that's it. The other interesting thing about it, although not particularly relevant, is that if the child or if the parent ends, the child's parent now becomes root, actually, which is like the main underlying process. Doesn't have a parent anymore. Parent died, unfortunately. Sad. But that's, uh, that's the way that goes. Good question. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. This, so the question is, look, if you wanted to pass along the PID to the child, you could call get PID before you fork, save it in a value, and then it's available later. Sure. Or the child can just call get PPID, which is get parent PID. So either one. But yeah, there's, there's ways of doing that. There, is, there are ways of sharing data, by the way. Um, but we're not going to cover that really in here. You'll see one example in a lab about sharing data. But most of it is not. Most of it doesn't need to be shared, as it turns out. I asked a, we asked a, a pretty good... Uh, in my humble opinion, question on the final last quarter where um, a lot of people thought, oh, no, we have to share memory, but you actually didn't have to, as it turned out. Uh, but So you won't really be responsible for doing much of that. Okay. All right. The reason the uh, parent and the child get these two different return values is simply to differentiate them. Okay. The first thing you will often do in a program is, if PID equals equals zero, do this, because I'm the child. I'll else do this. And that just says, OK, now I've got two different processes going in different directions. So that's generally what you do. Sometimes we want them both to do exactly the same thing for various reasons. But most of the time, we do want to make a decision and say, look, if I'm the child, I'm going to go down this path. If I'm the parent, I'm going to go down this path. They start at the exact same point, though. Okay, so that's the difference there. All right. So let's look at a program. OK, we're going we're gonna to write another program. Um, called basic fork. Oops. Oh no, I've done it again. Hang on. There we go. Cursor. There we go. OK. Basic fork dot. No, not, <laughs> not the binary. How about dot C? There we go. OK. So what we're going to do in here OK, is we are going to uh, actually just uh, print out greetings from a process. And then the per parent of that process. Okay, so that's what it's going to look like there. Okay, and then we're going to call fork. 
Okay, and we do a little bit of error checking. If the PID is negative one, it means the fork failed. Why would a fork fail? Maybe the operating system ran out of memory or some other thing happened. You will almost never see that. Actually, that's not true. You will see that if you try to do thousands of uh, processes. Your program is limited, at least on our system, to about 1,000, maybe 1,024 different processes. So if you tried to do uh, forking such that it just uh, kept creating many, many more processes, you'd get limited at about 1,024. There's a thing called a fork bomb, which, uh, would, which is where you just basically try to just do as many, you do kind of recursively call a fork or you call it in a loop where it just everybody forks and it just uses up all your processes. Um, this is why they had to limit it, <laughs> because you could take down a system by doing a fork bomb, um, which is very easy to do, as it turns out. Um, but anyway, uh, you we're going to check it there. And then we're going to print out bye-bye from process your, the process that we are going to get from calling get PID. And then we're going to also print out the parent process. Okay, everybody see how it's going to happen? Remember, by the time the program gets to this line here, there are now two processes going, the original parent and the child. And that's the difference. Okay. Now, we haven't done any checking to see who's the parent and the child. We don't really care for, for, this, uh, for this one right now. Okay, make basic fork. I think it's already done. Yep, okay. Basic fork, and there we go. All right, greetings from process 26385 with parent 2892. That's the shell, as it turns out. Okay, and then it says bye-bye from process 26385 with parent 2892, because it ended. And then it says bye-bye from process 26386 which has parent, a parent of 26385, and that is the parent that created it. Okay, so we can run this a number of times again. Uh, you probably will not see this with this tiny little program, but it turns out that the ordering of those two final lines, completely arbitrary. Okay, why? Because who knows who gets to go next, the parent or the child? It is completely arbitrary and non-deterministic. This is, the pro this is one of the harder parts about this class, is that you're now dealing with non-determinism. Okay? Debugging some of these things is very tricky if you, don't, if you don't have a real clear idea of what you're expecting, because you can run a program two or three times in a row, and it can come out absolutely different each time, but still be perfectly correct. Okay? So that's a little bit, a little bit uh, tricky to deal with sometimes. Question? I'm interested as to why that's <laughs> Oh, good question. That was a very good question. Why didn't the printf statements like bang into each other and, and print out like that? Uh, so printf actually has some buffering in it. And the way the printf function actually works, it's going to uh, generally keep like one call at a time is going to get through and it will print all the way to a new line. Now, if you were printing multiple things at once and some other program is printing multiple things at once, they might get interlaced. But one line at a time, not going to get interlaced. Good question though. Yeah, you will see some interlacing, but not, not one line at a time, generally. Yeah. When we get to uh, C++ using C out, uh, Jerry Kane actually created a library that makes it so it doesn't do that in C out either, which is nice. Yeah? When you were talking about making the child, and you said that you shouldn't do this and say, if our ID is zero, meaning we are the child process, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, yeah, so this is a good question. The question was, hey, wait a minute. When the parent process, when, when you do fork, like one's going and the other's going, maybe, maybe not at the same time. Okay, two different processes now. The operating system treats it just like any other two different processes. If there's only one processor available, the child gets to run for a little time, the parent gets to run for a little time, the child gets to run for a little time, the parent gets to run for a little time, and it's just shifted back and forth. If there's two processors, it actually could be that both are running on their own processor at exactly the same time. Literally the same time. Yeah, but that's the, that's the difference there. So the operating system is taking care of that and saying, great, now I have another process. I better time slice it so it gets a little bit of time to keep running. Yeah. We're going to see lots of those sorts of examples uh, as we go along. Okay. All right. Uh, so the, I just showed you the output of this. Um, the... As I said, the original process has its parent being the shell, um, and then this is non-deterministic. So we have to be a little careful of that when we're writing these programs because we can't necessarily predict the order. Question? No. Anybody else? I'm sure you'll have lots of questions on this stuff as we go a little bit farther. Okay. Uh, fork is called twice or called once. 
Fork returns twice, <laughs> right? It returns to your program twice in two separate processes, okay? Um, as I said, all segments of data are, are faithfully replicated, all right? The heap is replicated, pointers are replicated, file descriptors are replicated, which is interesting. It means that as it turns out, if you have a fork after you've opened a file and they both try to read from the file, the first one to read gets part of the file, the next one's cursor is actually moved over and gets more of the, other, uh, uh, the rest of it. So it's actually duplicated at that level, as it turns out. Okay? Um, the, uh, we will talk about how to deal with open file descriptors as we go along um, as well. Okay? What else? Any other questions on that? All right. Now, like I mentioned, debugging this is a bit tricky. Uh, you might want to say, you might be saying to yourself, hey, how do I actually go and debug this stuff? Well, it's a little tricky. Um, you can do it in GDB. Uh, I've given you the commands here. You can go look at uh, the actual, you can go look at the actual code uh, to do, to kind of the GDB trace if you want to. Um, I'm not going to go over that right now. But you can say, for instance, set detach on fork to off. Basically, what it normally does is GDB, if you have a fork, it just lets that child go and it continues with the parent. And the child processes on its own. If you set detach on fork off, what it does is it actually goes down the path of the child. GDB keeps track of the child process. You can do these things, you can do this thing called info inferiors, which is the two different or the, all the different processes. It gives you a list. You can switch between them if you want to. Uh, that's, that's down here. And you can also say, oh, if I'm going to uh, continue, I want to continue one of the processes and then start debugging the other one, you can do that. I would say most people probably don't get to this level, but if you want to and you're, multi and you're debugging, you're like, I really can't figure this out, this is how you would do it. Okay? It's not, not that often that you do that, but just know that it's there in case you go, ah, I have to go debug this in GDB. I have no idea how. That, go look at the trace and you'll see how to do it. Okay? All right. Like I said, the only real difference is the process ID and the return value from fork. Okay? You get a new pro you get a different process ID if you're the child from the parent, and the return value from fork is uh, is different. Okay? Parent gets the, pro the PID, child gets zero. Not its PID, but that's how we differentiate it from the parent. Okay, and that's how we make them go in different directions if we want to. Okay, uh, let's see. Another difference. Um, oh, let's see. Actually, this, this might be a duplicate slide. Hold on. Uh, no, not really. It's kind of got the. It's, it's re re replicating a bunch of information. Um, but there's no. Like I said, there's no default sharing. Okay, you can wait in the parent, we're going to get to that in a few minutes, uh, where you can say, hey, I want to wait for my children. In fact, we're going to talk about that for much of, like, for much of the multiprocessing uh, material. We're going to talk about, hey, how does the parent wait for all of its children appropriately and how does that work? So we're going to get to that. You can't wait for your parent, as it turns out. Not really allowed, the way it goes. Why? I don't know. They built it that way. You're not really allowed to wait for your parent. It turns out, when a child process ends, the parent can get notified, or the parent can wait for that. But it doesn't go the other direction. I'm not exactly sure why, but that's the way they, that's the way they built it. Okay. All right. Let's look at another program. Okay. We're going to look at a little program of a tree of forks. Okay. A tree of forks. Um, I think, let's see. Is this the one we want? Is it, hang on one, oops. There we go. Uh, nope. There we go. Let's let's look at the. Let's see if we're gonna do which which one we're gonna do. Um, hang on a sec. We want to look at. Well, let's just look at it here, and then I'll go run it uh, as we go. Here's what this is gonna do. Okay. Um, this is going to basically do a for loop around a bunch of fork calls. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we are going to uh, basically have a string called ktrail, okay? And we are going to uh, find out how long it is. We're going to loop through all the letters in that string or all the characters in that string. We're going to print them out at one letter at a time, but in the meantime, we're going to fork, 
Okay? And then in this case, it's an assert that just says, look, if the PID is, uh, assert that the PID is greater than or equal to zero, which would make it so that if anything failed, it, it would crash the program or stop the program. And then it will keep going down. Okay? What do you think is going to happen here? If the string is A, B, C, D, oops, if the string is A, B, C, D, what is going to happen uh, in here? The first thing that's going to happen is what? It's going to print out A. Okay. And then we're going to end up with, here's the parent, we're going to end up with a child process. Okay. And then the for loop is going to come back here. Remember, it's going through the same, it's got the same value of i, it's got the same value for the string and same value, all that. Okay, but now there are two things going through here. i is going to be incremented to 1, okay, and then it is going to print what from the child? B. And then what's going to get printed from the parent? B. Do we know what order that's going to happen in? We have no idea, but it doesn't matter because they're both B, right? But then what's going to happen with the parent? The parent is going to create a child, and the child is going to create a child, and then everybody is going to go back up here, and the, they're all going to be on C now. How many different versions of C are we going to get? Four. One, two, three, four. Not necessarily in that order. And then all four are going to each create another child, and another child, and another child, and another child. They get all of them. And they all create a child. How many different Ds are we going to have? Eight different Ds. Let's try it. Okay, let's try it. And I have to figure out which program this is because I think I, I forgot which one it is. Um, we are going to look for trail length. Hang on, uh, trail length. Start and see. Fork puzzle. That's the one. Okay. Uh, uh, let's see. Fork. Oh no. Wait, wait, hang on. M fork might might not be actually written. Oh, it's not written. Hold on. Copy for. I have I have it written. Original. Let's see. To fork puzzle. Let's see. Okay. Yes. Make fork puzzle. Okay. Okay, ready? A, B, C, D, A, B, C, B, D, C, D, C, D, D, D. Uh-oh. Not the order we necessarily would have hoped for, right? It's not 1A, 2Bs, 3, 4Cs, 8Ds. But there are that many, right? 1A, I see 1A, 1, 2, uh, let's see, 2Bs, 1, 2, 3, 4Cs, and then 8Ds, I assume. Okay. All right, let's uh, try running it again. Oh, what happened there? Why do I have my, my line here and a D way over here? Any ideas? What's that? The, yeah, the parent finished first. Good answer. Yeah, the parent finished first, and one of the children was still doing its uh, printing. After the parent finished, the shell got it back and did that, right? So we can, uh, we can do it a few more times. There you go. Got the same sort of thing again, right? That time it happened, we work okay. But remember, non-deterministic, and that's the way it goes. So let's spend a minute just making sure everybody understands what's happening in this program. What questions do you have about it? You get why there are 1A, 2Bs, 4Cs, et cetera. Yeah? So like, why there are multiple? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the question was, okay, I get that it's, I get that why there all the letters there, why there all those letters. Why is it out of order? Is it because you have uh, these multiple processes given time from the operating system? It's exactly that, and it turns out that uh, the parent in there must have gotten the like, gotten the signal to keep going through all of its D's before one of the children did. And in some cases, the child and children all end before the parent. So it's, it's completely non-deterministic in that sense. You can't control it, okay, in that sense. There are ways to control what happens. We will get to that. Um, many times, you don't want to necessarily hinder them from going in a particular order, but sometimes you need them to go in a particular order. So we'll talk about that, too. Question? Yeah. Um, so if you have, a, you have a parent, and then you have a child, and then there's an additional fork that ends up with grandchildren, let's say. Um, yes. So Grandchildren, not the children, yes. The child uh, finishes and then basically disappears, but those grandchildren aren't done. Is 
their new parent the original parent, or is it the like terminal? Will they return to the terminal? That's a good question. I believe that any time your parent, the question was, hey, what happens when the children's children die? Do they, their parent now become the grandparent and so forth? No, I don't. I think it just becomes all the way to root. I think if your parent dies, you're just kind of become an orphan. You go all the way up to root, right? <laughs> right? So yeah, I think that's what, that's what happens with that one. Root is not the same as shell. Root is like the kernel, basically, running its running. There might be some other program, but yeah, it's, uh, it's not the shell. It's not. The shell can end, and the other programs will continue as well, unless there's some other method to kill them. Yeah, as it turns out. Good, yeah. Could you explain again, like, who the speaker is just Yeah, so the question was, hey, explain again what happens with the D at the end. Let's see if we can get it to work. No, no, there we go. Okay, so why did that D show up after my terminal line showed up, well, remember, there's the parent process, which when it ends, the terminal says, oh, you've ended? Here's a, here's a prompt again. Type something else, right? If the parent process ends before all of its children do, then it will do that. And the child can still be running and print out to there. We're gonna see, we're gonna see an example of that um, uh, I guess on Wednesday, where we're going to get into some of these crazy ones where you go, oh, wow, it really does do that. Like it just, it will print out, you can type LS and it will still be printing stuff out from your program and, and whatever, right? You can, you can do that. Um, let, let me, let me show, try something like this. For I in, uh, let's see, uh, let's do this. Sequence 1 through 100. Do echo I done. Nope, echo dollar sign I done. There we go. Okay, that's going to print out, this is bash, it's a different programming language, it's going to print out 100 numbers in a row. But if we do this and we say uh, sleep for one second in between, it's going to print one, two, three, etc. Right? If we do this and we can run this, what we call in the background, I don't know if you've ever done this before, it is now running and I can type ls <laughs> And my program is running along in the background <laughs> and doing its thing, right? I mean, I can even, it's even crazier than that. I can do like vim and then, oh boy, you know? <laughs> so it, 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 uh, it'll do this until it gets up to 100. And it's just two processes running at the same time and they're both trying to print out to the terminal and they don't care that, you know, one's going and one's not. So um, that's what, yeah. So there you go. It'll just, it'll just keep going, right, until you do that. Uh, I think I can still end VIM and whatever, and it'll just keep going, right? Um, you can actually, uh, no, you can't. You can put it in the foreground and then kill it, but um, you will learn all about this when you do the Stanford Shell assignment, which is coming up in a few weeks, um, where you, uh, you have to build this, and it, you end up with things like this, but yeah. But does that answer your question about how it's happening? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the question was, what, what's the significance of when the parent process dies before the child does? Nothing really. I mean, there's no real significance except for the fact that you can end up back in the shell and you might not want to be. Like, we don't like it that it printed out that D after our, after our prompt. We want it to be like, look, finish everything, then print out the thing. And we'll, uh, we'll see examples of that straight, uh, straight away on Wednesday. Yeah. Yes? Uh, why is there always one child? We do have multiple children. We did in a... Uh, oh, why is there always one? They're both, they're all, that's a good question. They're all going roughly the same time, right? It's such a fast program. They're roughly going at the same time. It could very easily come out that there's two. I mean, you just don't know. But they're, they're, they're pretty much doing it all at the same time before the, and the, the parent will, will just end almost at the same time and sometimes one will be out. But there's no significance to just having one. Yeah, good question. All right, what else? Yeah? Can you choose to fork only one process, or does it fork every process that's going on? Good question. If we look at the program, the question was, can you choose to just do one fork each time? Well, sure. How about this? What if we wanted to stop the program at the end, at the end of... What if we wanted to stop the uh, program? So let's look at uh, forkpuzzle.c, okay? Okay, so we have the fork there, okay? Um, let's do, let's see, what would be interesting here? If we did, if we said this, if PID equals zero, now we know we're in the child, right? We could say, um, oh, I don't know, printf by 
from, you know, whatever. And then we could also do exit zero, or we could do return zero, or whatever we want. Let's do return zero. Return zero, and that will actually say, okay, I'm done, and not go through the fork, right? Fork puzzle, fork puzzle, right? And now it's going to just do the parent only. All the other children did their like buys, but nobody ever got back in the for loop. So you can just use, you have to figure out the logic for that. Yeah. Good, good question. All right. Anybody else? Yes. Ah, that's a good question. The question was, if we had one processor and you were forking a process, are you necessarily going to, are you ever going to make the program faster because of that? Probably not, no. I mean, if you're trying to do a certain amount of work and you have one processor to do it, unless there's some other thing going on, like for instance, you're waiting for network or you're waiting for a file to be read or something like that, that can take some time. Um, other than that, no, you're not going to save time. This is not necessarily a time-saving sort of thing. It's kind of a logic thing where we want something to happen. Look, the shell is doing exactly this. It's forking a process and running whatever you tell it to run. And so, so we will use that method more than just this kind of funny, like, oh, do lots of things for multiple processes. Yeah, good question. All right, I think we will see you guys on Wednesday. <laughs>